what philosophy is in the Christian context, namely the handmade to theology, an entirely independent standing discipline, but one which in a Christian context is ordered to the same thing that theology is, namely to bring us into a greater knowledge of God through knowing the world that he has created. And so philosophy, like theology, uh, orders us to God and uh, helps us to attain happiness. I'm grateful for that generous introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here, where I have a number of old friends, and I'm sure I'm going to make some new ones as well. My topic in this lecture is the relation of human persons to God. In particular, I want to explore the nature of union between God and a human person. I will first consider the nature of union possible between two human persons who love each other as friends, and then I will turn to the analogous union between God and a human being. But it should be added that because God is metaphysically greater than human beings, union with God will also be something metaphysically greater than the union between two human friends. Traditionally in Christian theology, this metaphysically greater union is constituted at least in part by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Although the notion of indwelling at issue here is a commonplace of theological discussion, it is remarkably difficult to say what it comes go on to examine the additional element in Christian theology of God's indwelling a human person. The resulting account, I think, gives us some insight into the nature of union between God and human beings. It's helpful to start with a brief account of the nature of love, and the best account I know is that of Thomas Aquinas. For Aquinas, love requires two interconnected desires. One, for the good of the beloved, and one for union with the beloved. Certain things should be noted briefly about each of these desires. To begin with, it's worth pointing out that the desire for union is not equivalent to the desire to be in the company of the beloved. Other philosophers have remarked that one can love a person without desiring to be in that person's company, and being in someone's company is obviously not equivalent to being united with her. It's manifestly possible to be in the company of someone when one is alienated from her rather than united to her. With regard to the desire for the good of the beloved, the goodness in question is not to be identified with moral goodness only. It's goodness in the broader sense that encompasses beauty, elegance, or efficiency, and metaphysical as well as moral goodness. Furthermore, because Aquinas holds that there's an objective standard of goodness, the measure of value for the goodness at issue in love is also objective. Given Aquinas's ethical views, then, the good of the beloved has to be understood as that which truly is in the interest of the beloved and which truly does conduce to the beloved's flourishing. It's important to see here also that because of the strong connection Aquinas maintains between God and goodness, anything that contributes to the objective good for a person also brings her closer to God. The beloved's closeness to God and her flourishing as the best person she can be will therefore be covariant. So to desire the good of the beloved on the standard of goodness Aquinas accepts, is to desire for the beloved those things that in fact contribute to the beloved's flourishing, and these will also increase the beloved's closeness to God. Finally, it's important to see that for Aquinas, the two desires of love are not independent of each other, but rather interrelated. And when the two desires of love appear to conflict, Aquinas' claim that the ultimate good for human beings is union with God 
gives a method for harmonizing them. Union with God is shareable, and persons united with God are also united with each other. Ultimately, then, ultimately, the same thing, namely union with God, constitutes both the final good of each person in a loving relationship and also their deepest union with each other. The two desires of love are therefore interrelated in mutually governing ways. We can conclude this very brief presentation of Aquinas's account of love by considering the way in which it applies to the special case of God's love of human persons. On traditional Christian doctrine, God is perfectly loving to all human beings. And so, on Aquinas's account of love, God desires the good of each human person and union with her. But for God, the two desires of love converge. That's because, as I just explained, the ultimate good of a human person, her ultimate flourishing, just is union with God. So in desiring the good for a human person and union with a human person, God is desiring the same thing, at least where the ultimate good is concerned. In addition, there is this difference between the love of one human being for another and God's love for a human being. In the case of love between human beings, when one person, Paula, desires union with another person, Jerome, Paula needs to be responsive to Jerome. Suppose, for example, that Paula is a, a musician, but that Jerome is incurably musically illiterate. Maybe he had a right hemisphere stroke or something of that sort. Then if Paul understands Jerome's condition, it would be cruel of her, not loving, to insist on trying to share her musical creativity with him. But in God's case, things are the other way around. When God loves Jerome, God's love is not responsive to goodness in Jerome. Instead, God's love is the source of whatever goodness or excellence there is in Jerome. On Aquinas' view and on all resolutely anti-Pelagian views, any goodness whatsoever in creatures is derived from God directly or indirectly. Like many others in this tradition, Aquinas supposes that there is nothing good in any creature which is not in one way or another a gift of God, whereby God enables creatures to imitate something in God's nature. On this view, in loving Jerome and desiring the good for Jerome, God is offering goodness to Jerome. If Jerome does not resist God's love, then God's love is productive of goodness in Jerome and not responsive to goodness Jerome has already produced in himself by himself. For these reasons, anything good in Jerome and any closeness to God on Jerome's part is brought about in Jerome entirely by God. But it is also true that Jerome is ultimately responsible. He is ultimately responsible for whether or not he is in union with God. Even on Aquinas' resolutely anti-Pelagian views, because Jerome can always resist the love of God, God's bringing about goodness in Jerome is responsive to something in Jerome. It's always open to Jerome to resist God's love and grace or to cease resisting God's love and grace. And so even on anti-Pelagian views, Jerome actually has alternative possibilities with regard to God's giving him grace. So mutatis mutandis, Aquinas' account of love applies also to God's love for human beings. Although God's love for human beings is in some respects a special case, nonetheless, Aquinas' account of love as consisting in two mutually governing desires, for the good of the beloved and for union with the beloved, that account of love holds with regard to God's love also. With this much summary of Aquinas' account of love, we can now turn to the notion of union, the union that is desired in love. In my view, the sort of union of love possible among mentally fully functioning adult human beings who are friends requires two things, personal presence, and mutual closeness. Mutual closeness is necessary for union, but two persons could be close to each other and still not united to each other because something separates them, 
even while they remain close during their separation. What is missing for the separated friends is the presence of one of them to the other, and so presence is also an element of union. It is clear that there are various kinds of presence for one human being with another and for God with human beings also. So for example, Paula's being present with regard to Jerome can be nothing more than a matter of her being here now where Jerome is and when Jerome is. And analogously, even for immaterial God, there is a kind of presence that involves relations to both space and time. The relations involved in presence with regard to space and time are typically characterized as presence in or presence at. But in addition, there is another kind of presence, a second personal presence that one person can have to another, and it's the kind of presence crucial for union. Personal presence is the kind of presence we have in mind when we say complainingly, for example, she read the paper all through dinner and was never present to any of the rest of us. Or, he sat with me at the defendant's table, but he was never really present with me during the trial. In these two little examples, there is presence at a time and in a place, but some kind of presence characterized by one or another kind of second personal psychological connection, that's missing. Typically, this kind of presence is characterized as presence with or presence to another person. As I just sketched it, this is a unilateral personal presence, but mutual personal presence is also possible. It's mediated by a certain kind of mutual awareness of the kind that arises, for example, when one person meets the eyes of another. This kind of mutual personal presence manifestly comes in degrees. There's the minimal kind that can arise when one momentarily catches the eyes of a stranger on a bus. At the other end of the scale, there's the kind of intense and intimate mutual personal presence that is possible between two persons who are mutually close to each other and engaged in mutual gaze. This kind of presence is a significant personal presence. Although mutual closeness is necessary for this kind of intense presence, it's not sufficient. What else is needed is shared attention. It's hard to overemphasize the importance of shared attention for human life and development. Shared attention is currently the subject of much discussion among philosophers, psychologists, and neuroscientists. But all attempts to give a clear and adequate account of it seem at best incomplete. Still, it is a phenomenon everyone recognizes, and clear examples of it are easy to find. When a mother looks into the eyes of her baby and the baby looks back, they are sharing attention. As between adults, shared attention is partly a matter of mutual knowledge of the sort that prompts philosophical worry about the possibility of unstoppable infinite regress. Paula is aware of Joe Rome's being aware of Paula's being aware of Joe Rome's being aware and so on. The object of awareness for Paula is simultaneously Jerome and their mutual awareness. And the object of awareness for Jerome is simultaneously Paula and their mutual awareness and so on. These lines are misleading in multiple ways and inadequate to capture the phenomenon of shared attention but they help give some idea of it. Shared attention is also required for a significant personal presence. If Jerome were to say of Paula, she was distracted and was never really present to me, one of the things he would be complaining about would be Paula's failure to share attention with him. So in addition to presence at a place or in a time, as between persons, Yet another kind of presence is possible in which one person, Paula, has a kind of direct access to the mind of another person, Jerome. Such an access enables what you might call a knowledge of persons, and that is essential to presence between persons. Paula can't be present to Jerome if Jerome somehow blocks her from having such access to him 
And without such mutual presence, there cannot be union of love between Paula and Jerome. We can think of the mental access in question as a function both of empathy and of what contemporary neuroscientists and psychologists call mind reading. When Paula mind reads Jerome or has empathy with Jerome, she has a kind of personal presence to Jerome which has something of the character that telepathy would have if telepathy were real, as it is not. Just to make sure you heard me say that. <laughs> In empathy, for example, Paula can feel within herself Jerome's feeling, for example. In mind reading, Paula somehow has within herself something of the mind of Jerome. That is, in mind reading Jerome, to one degree or another, Paula can sense as internal in her own psychology Jerome's intentions or emotions. Consequently, when Paula mind reads Jerome, Paula is in some sense there, present with or present to Jerome. We now know much more about empathy and mind reading than we did only a few decades ago, and we recognize now that cognitive capacities afforded by certain recently discovered neurological systems also enable the ability for empathy and mind reading more generally. Because of recent work in neuroscience and developmental psychology, especially work on the impairments among autistic children, we have learned a great deal about the neurological systems that make empathy and mind reading possible and about the kind of cognition that these systems produce. Whatever ties together the different clinical signs of all the degrees of autism spectrum disorder, the most salient feature of the disorder is an impairment in the cognitive capacities enabling mind reading. The knowledge which is impaired for an autistic child, however, cannot be taken as knowledge that something or other is the case. Think about it this way. A non-autistic pre-linguistic infant is capable of mind reading. She can know her mother, and to one extent or another, she can also know something of her mother's mental states. But the infant isn't capable of knowledge that a particular person is her mother, or any kind of knowledge that. Conversely, an autistic child can know that his mother is sad, say because she's told him so, and she's a reliable authority for the child. But the impairment characteristic of autism can leave the autistic child without the direct and immediate knowledge of the sadness of his mother. What's impaired for the autistic child is just a non-propositional knowledge of persons, and a direct intuitive awareness of their mental states. So in typically functioning human beings, mind reading yields a non-propositional direct and immediate intuitive knowledge that gives access to persons and their mental states. One neurobiologist doing research on mind reading, Vittorio Galese, he tries to explain the relevant neural mechanisms involved in the knowledge of persons this way. This is what he says. The brain maps representation across different spaces inhabited by different actors. These spaces are blended within a unified common intersubjective space which paradoxically doesn't segregate any subject. This space is we-centric. The shared intentional space is not meant to distinguish the agent from the observer. And Galese goes on to try to explain empathy in this way. He says, self-other identity goes beyond the domain of action. It incorporates sensations, affect, and emotions. The shared intersubjective space in which we live from birth continues long after birth to constitute a substantial part of our semantic space. When we observe other individuals acting, facing their full range of expressive power, a meaningful embodied link between individuals is automatically established. Sensations and emotions displayed by others can be empath empathized with and therefore implicitly understood through a mirror-matching mechanism in the brain. 
In other words, what Galatia is trying to tell us is something like this. In mind reading between human beings, there's a sense in which one person has a kind of intuitive entrance to the thought, affect, or intention in the mind of another person. And so because of the intermingling of minds made possible by the relevant neural systems, one person can be present to another in virtue of having a kind of direct access to the mind of that other. If Paula is riding in the subway next to Jerome, then she's minimally present to Jerome in virtue of being out of time and out of place where Jerome is also. If Jerome should happen to look at her while she's looking at him, then there might be some shared attention between them. But if Jerome is a blank book to her, if his mind is closed to her, then to that extent she's not able to be present to him with the kind of personal presence I'm trying to sketch here. In virtue of the fact that he somehow closed his mind to her, she's distant from him, even if she's standing next to him. On the other hand, if Jerome's mind is open to Paula, then the kind of presence to a person made possible by the relevant neural mechanisms is greatly enhanced. When Paula mind reads Jerome, the relevant neural systems in Paula give Paula a direct, as it were, perceptual awareness of something in Jerome's thoughts, emotions, or intentions. This awareness arises in Paula because in mind reading Jerome, she's in effect experiencing something of Jerome's mental states. In this experience and awareness, she's also present with Jerome, with personal presence, in a way she couldn't be if his mind weren't open to her. There's a limited degree of this kind of personal presence when Paula winces as she sees Jerome slice his finger with his steak knife, even if Jerome's unaware that Paula's watching him. That's a kind of presence of one person with another that's possible, even if the two people are strangers to each other, even if they know and heartily dislike each other. So, for example, Paula can wince at Jerome's pain even while she thinks that his suffering that pain serves him right. <clears throat> and if Paula is close to Jerome, then her shared attention with Jerome will yield not only her access to his mind, but also her significant personal presence to him. So that's a kind of uni unilateral way that can happen. But there's a much greater degree of personal presence when two people who are already mutually close to each other in loving relationship are mutually mind reading each other in intense shared attention. In personal presence of that mutual and intimate kind, there can be something stronger than the asymmetrical, asymmetrical relation of Paul's being present to Jerome. There can be a mutual inness between the persons who are mutually close to each other, and that mutual inness yields a powerful personal presence of each to the other. When this kind of shared second personal presence occurs, one way to describe the connection is to say that the two people involved are united in love. With these background reflections on the nature of union between two human persons, I want now to turn to the nature of union between God and a human person. And we can start with that issue of mind reading and empathy. Since on orthodox theological doctrine, God is omniscient, God knows all truths. And so God has propositional knowledge or the divine equivalent of propositional knowledge as regards the mental states of all human beings. God knows that Paula is sad or that Jerome intends to shake hands with her and so on. But it seems that with respect to human persons, God can't have empathy and he can't have mind reading in, of the sort I just finished describing. Think about it this way. When Paula has empathy with Jerome, she feels within herself what, what Jerome feels. But in virtue of having no body, God has no feelings either. This is the point of the scholastic doctrine that God is impassable. Strictly speaking, a pasio, which is the thing an impassable God lacks, a pasio is a feeling, and a feeling includes bodily sensations. Nothing immaterial can have bodily sensations. <clears throat> 
And so immaterial God has no feelings either in this sense of feeling. And here I just need to say a footnote. This claim that God has no feelings is very different from the claim with which it is often confused, namely the theologically unacceptable claim that God has no emotions, which is a different matter altogether. Mind reading extends to more than knowledge of the feelings of another person, but all mind reading is like empathy in having a shared qualitative feel. When Paula mind reads Jerome, she shares something of Jerome's mental state in virtue of somehow feeling that mental state in herself. Paula knows Jerome's intention to shake her hand, say, because her brain forms the neural pattern it would form if Paula were going to move her arm to shake hands with somebody. And so by feeling it within herself, she knows Jerome's intention to shake her hand. An immaterial God can't form an intention to move his arm to shake hands because he has no arm to move. And so although God can know that Jerome intends to shake hands with Paula, it seems that God cannot mind read Jerome's intention in the direct and intuitive way Paula can. And this point generalizes. A human psyche is too small and God's mind is too great, one might say, for God to contain human mental states within himself in the shared way the relevant neural systems make possible as between human beings. And so it seems the sharing and the presence with a, a person that is the hallmark of the knowledge of persons is ruled out for God. But appearances are misleading here. Whatever else can be said on this score, in this respect, Christianity has special resources because of the doctrine that God became incarnate in Christ. The Chalcedonian formula for the incarnate Christ stipulates that Christ is one person with two natures. The one person is the second person of the Trinity and is thus God. And the two natures are the divine and the human. It is one of the consequences of the Chalcedonian formula that there are in Christ two minds, one human, and one divine, but only one person, a divine person, who is the possessor of both those minds. For this reason, through the assumed human nature of Christ, God can have empathy with human persons and can also mind read them, since God can use the human mind of the assumed human nature to know human persons in the knowledge of persons way. So the Chalcedonian formula for the incarnate Christ gives a way of explaining and defending God's knowledge of persons through mind reading and the presence with a human person that mind reading enables God to have. The kind of presence mediated by the mind reading that God can have with all human persons, at least in consequence of the incarnation, falls short of the second personal presence obtaining between persons united in love, however. When Christ mind reads in ordinary ways or even miraculously, he does so because of the power of his human capacity for mind reading. But miraculous or merely human, by itself, this kind of mind reading produces a, a unilateral and not a mutual presence. There's an asymmetry about it that limits mutual presence. It's part of orthodox theological doctrine, however, that when a person, Paula, comes to faith, she opens herself up to God in love. In an act of free will that is part of faith, Paula accepts God's grace and begins a relation of mutual love with God. In entering into this relationship, Paula accepts not only God's grace, but also God himself. On Orthodox Christian doctrine, when Paula comes to faith in this way, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, comes to dwell in her. However exactly it is to be understood, on the theological claims involving the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit puts the mind of God within Paula's psyche. On Trinitarian doctrine, there is only one mind and one will in God, and this one mind and one will are common to all three persons of the Trinity. In consequence of the strong and intimate connection established by the Holy Spirit's indwelling Paula, 
The relationship of love between God and Paula yields maximal second personal presence of God with Paula. But how are we supposed to understand that theological claim about the Holy Spirit's indwelling? It's not easy to specify what that indwelling is supposed to come to. We can start by saying what it is not. God's indwelling in Paul is not merely a matter of God's having direct and immediate causal and cognitive access to Paul's mind. Since God is omnipotent and omniscient, God has this kind of access to the mind of every human being with regard to propositional knowledge or the divine analog of it. And at least through the human mind of Christ, God also has access to every human mind with the non-propositional knowledge garnered by mind reading. For every human person, it's possible for omniscient God to know the mind of that person with direct and unmediated awareness of the mind reading kind. These kinds of cognitive relations between God and human beings hold then for every human person. But the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is found only in those people who have faith and are in grace. And so these kinds of cognitive relations resulting from God's omniscience are insufficient as an explanation of the nature of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. God's indwelling constitutes or causes in part or in whole union of love between God and a human person and so we might try understanding indwelling as an analog to the psychic relation between human persons who are united in love. The psychic relation between mutually loving human beings is a particularly intimate kind of mind reading accompanied by shared intention, shared attention when those persons are mutually close to each other. And so we might suppose that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is just like that, the same set of relations between God and a human person. But that approach is not quite right either. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is meant to be something ontologically more powerful than mutual closeness accompanied by intense shared attention. In the Holy Spirit's indwelling, God himself is supposed somehow to be within each person in grace. Although a material God cannot be contained within a material container, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit does include God's being somehow within the psyches of those human persons in grace. At this point, it may help to return to Galeze's attempt to describe the kinds of relations that are involved in mind reading. According to Galeze, when Paula mind reads Jerome's intentions, her mind goes into the configuration it would have if she were Jerome. But this configuration in Paula is offline, as we say. It's not actively connected to the other parts of her, not actively connected, for example, to her muscles. So she might have the motor configuration for shaking hands, but on her part, no shaking hands occurs. So the configuration of Jerome's intention is in Paula, and because it is, it is Paula's but it's in Paula's as Jerome's intention and not as hers. And that complicated state is what Galeze is trying to describe when he says there is a we-centric part of the human brain, a we-centric part that enables a real sharing of mental states. Galeze is talking about brain systems in order to make a point about mental states. Aquinas makes a roughly analogous point about mechanisms of cognition for perception, and it seems to me Aquinas' way of putting the point is helpful. For Aquinas, when a person, Paula, sees an object such as a coffee cup, the configuration or form inhering in the cup makes the matter of the cup be a cup. But that configuration can be transferred to Paula's mind. The form that is in the cup is then also in Paula's mind only in a, different, in a different way, in an encoded state, as we would say. So um, the configuration of the cup, as Aquinas thinks of perception, is both in the cup and in Paula. And analogously, we might say, when Paula mind reads Jerome's intention, there's a form or configuration in Jerome's mind that's also in Paula's. She mind reads them because she shares this form with them. The same configuration is in each of them, 
only differently insofar as it's offline in Paulo. Furthermore, although the configuration of the cup is really in Paula's mind when she sees the cup, the configuration encoded in Paula is encoded in such a way as to let Paula know the cup. Analogously, when the configuration of Jerome's intention is in Paula's mind, that configuration is in her mind in an encoded way that lets her know Jerome and his intention. So the configuration of Jerome's mind is in two places, in Jerome's mind and in Paula's. But Jerome feels it as his, and Paula feels it as belonging to Jerome. So it's possible for a person to have neurologically and psychologically within her mind something that is her own and yet also part of another person. Furthermore, it is possible for Paula to feel this dichotomy. That is, it can be subjectively accessible to her. She can consciously identify a mental state as within her own mind, and yet somehow also identify it as not hers, but Jerome's. If Paula sees Jerome impale his bare foot on a nail in the garden, she will wince with pain. So something of Jerome's pain is in Paula, and she winces because she feels it within herself. But even while she feels this pain in herself, she's also conscious that what she feels is Jerome's pain and not hers. In feeling that pain, she is sharing with Jerome what is Jerome's. So think about it this way. Because of the systems in the human brain for recognizing some mental states as one's own, it's possible for a person to have a sense of the mind operative in him, not as his own, but as somebody else's. Since this is so, it's possible for the inner subjectivity of mental states enabled by these neurological systems and evident in mind reading, it's possible for them to transform from a merely psychological sharing to something that is metaphysical and ontological. It's possible, that is, that what is in Jerome's mind is not just another person's thought, but in fact the other person's whole mind. And if such a thing is possible, then indwelling is not a bad word for this kind of relationship of one mind to another. Now, science fiction is replete with stories in which malevolent non-human beings indwell a human mind. And those stories are frightening and revulsive because in the stories, the indwelling mind invades the mind of a vulnerable human person against that human person's will, and at least without that human person's consent. And typically in those stories also, the invader has only hatred and contempt for its human victim. But when two people, two human persons, Paul and Jerome, are psychically united to each other in love with the sharing of attention that union requires, then the inner weaving of their psyches occurs only with the willingness of each one to the other. Paula's psyche is open to Jerome's because Paula wants it to be, and the same is true of Jerome's psyche with respect to Paula. The resulting shared openness is wanted by each of them, and when they have it, it yields gladness and peace. Furthermore, insofar as they love each other, each of them wishes for the good of each other. And so the vulnerability of each of them to the other in the openness of love is acceptable to each of them too, because of the trust that each is rightly willing to place in the other. In the fullest expression of such uniting in love, each of the persons is in a relationship which it makes them second personally present with the other as much as is possible between human beings. But an even more powerful second personal presence of shared love is possible for God in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As in the case of two human persons united in love, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit requires welcome on the part of a human person, Paula. When Paula comes to faith and accepts God's grace and love, then and only then the Holy Spirit comes to indwell in Paula. In coming to faith, Paula freely accepts God, and the consequent union between Paula and God is characterized by shared love, freely given and freely accepted. <clears throat> 
in the union of love between God and a human person, then what is within the psyche of a human person, Paula, is not just the thoughts and intentions of God, but God himself. Nonetheless, nothing of Paula's own individual personhood is lost in the process. Paula's mind remains her own, and her awareness of her mind as her own also remains. Nonetheless, when the Holy Spirit indwells in her, Paula will be aware of the Spirit's mind within her own, and there will be shared mind reading between them. In consequence, Paula will have as present as possible, not only with herself, but even within herself, the God who is her beloved. And now it is easier to see Aquinas' complicated lore of the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit. The list of the fruits of the Holy Spirit begins this way, love, joy, and peace. Love because, love for a person, Paula, because her beloved God who loves her is present to her. Joy because of the dynamic interaction with her beloved who's present to her in second personal ways. And peace because her heart already has what it most desires, her beloved Lord present to her. On orthodox theological doctrine, there is no faith, no life of grace, without the indwelling Holy Spirit, with its concomitant gifts and fruits, with its concomitant love, joy, peace, and the other fruits of this union. So the Christian idea, then, is that in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God can be more powerfully present in love and more united with a human person of faith than any other human person could be. In the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God is present to a person of faith with maximal second personal presence, surpassing even the presence possible between two human persons united in mutual love. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit makes a union that makes God and a human person one without merging one into the other or without in any other way depriving the human person of his own self, his own mind, and his own will. And so here's my last line, and then I'm done. For a person in union with God, God is Emmanuel, God with us, not only psychologically, but also literally, that is, spiritually and ontologically. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Is our intention at these talks that there be a kind of dialogue established between theology and philosophy. In Professor Stump we have a primarily philosophy professor who is very conversant in theology. In our respondent we have a uh, theologian who is very conversant in philosophy. Our respondent received his doctorate in theology from the Catholic University of America. He is professor of theology at Ave Maria University, having taught previously at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, NDI Graduate Facility for Christendom College, St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana, and the Catholic University of America. He has published in numerous areas in theology and philosophy, including Thomistic Moral Theology and Philosophy and Natural Law, Systematic Theology <clears throat> regarding the relation of nature and grace and regarding grace, freedom, and predestination, metaphysics, and theological and philosophical anthropology, among other things. Among his publications are the books Analogia Entis on the Analogy of Being, Metaphysics, and the Act of Faith, University of Notre Dame Press, 2011, and Natura Pura, on the recovery of nature in the doctrine of grace, Fordham University Press, 2010. Please join me in welcoming back to the Dominican Colloquium in Berkeley, Professor Stephen A. Long. <laughs> 
Thank you. It's, it's truly a, a joy and an honor. By the way, is this all right? Am I too close to the microphone? I have a way of hovering over it, so I don't want to destroy your drums. It's, it's, it's truly a joy and honor to attempt a, a brief response to the rich reflections Professor Stump has shared with us this evening. Of course, not the least value of her remarks is their intelligent account of the nature of human empathy and its foundation in cognitive perception. There seems no reason not to embrace her account of the Thomistic analysis of love into the component elements of willing the good of the beloved and willing union with the beloved. This is likewise the case with her observation that for God, the willing of the creature's union with God and the willing of the good for that person are identical. While there are questions of scope that could be raised regarding being in the company of another, something that seems amenable both to very thin and very thick readings, as for example, one recollects the phrase, being among the company of the righteous. Nonetheless, her account distinguishing mere proximity from the reciprocal shared attentiveness of those who love one another is unassailable. Along the way of her remarks, one does happen upon a strategic theological consideration touching a subject that runs like a seismic event affecting the theological landscape. Here I speak of her formulation of the relative role of the creature and of the divine permissive decree of evil with respect to grace and the divine good. Professor Stump affirms that, quote, if Jerome does not resist God's love, then God's love is productive of goodness in Jerome, not responsive to the goodness Jerome has already produced in himself by himself, end quote. Yet she also states that, quote, even on Aquinas' resolutely anti-Pelagian views, because Jerome can always resist the love of God, God's bringing about goodness in Jerome is responsive to something in Jerome, end quote. On the one hand, Professor Stump's embrace of the anti-Pelagian intention is pronounced and salutary. On the other hand, normally, I would wish to observe at this point that her formulation appears to share the kind of problems that may be found both in Maritain's account of the permission of evil and alternately in the philosophy of logic of Gottlob Frege. The proposition that God bestows grace and that if only the creature does not negate grace, the creature will then receive grace is somewhat like saying that God bestows to the creature a nose and if only the creature does not not have a nose, then the creature will have a real nose. In, in other words, the formulation presents as causal what is not causal because in a real subject, negation of negation is something positive. This means that for a real person not to negate grace is nothing different from having actually received grace any more than not, not to have a nose can be anything different in a real subject from having a nose. Thus, there is more to the theological story here than simply the creature with its hand on the tiller, as she acknowledges, uh, as the question of the divine permission of evil is not permission in the garden variety sense in which one person may permit another to do something. This is without prejudice to Dr. Dr. Stump's observation that, quote, even on anti-Pelagian views, Jerome has alternative possibilities for willing with regard to God's giving him grace. But this presupposes extensive consideration both of the nature of free will and of its relation to God. By the divine simplicity, it is not possible for God to bring about an entirely indeterminate effect, which would be indistinguishable from God bringing about no effect at all, thus nullifying divine causality. Of course, my reference to Frege above is a reference to his famed observation that, quote, being is only the negation of naught, end quote, which suffers the exact same lack of distinction betw between conceptual and real negation of negation that one finds in Maritain's formulation and that of others. Because these considerations might easily consume the entirety of our time, and the truth is there's so much of value in Professor Stump's lecture that is of more primary importance to the object of this lecture itself, it seems reasonable to move onward to the heart of her analysis rather than linger at the periphery. Even though taken in a wider context, this subject is of objectively great importance. Professor Stump's distinction between mere physico-temporal presence and the kind of shared attention uh, 
requisite for intense presence to or with another seems to me remarkably fine in its motion from ordinary experience to the formal intentional aspects of empathy and what she calls mind reading, a phrase that confessedly to me seems less felicitous than simple anticipation or understanding of another's dispositions, still it brings out the aspect that something occurring in one person is somehow present to another in an intentional form, which reveals to that second person something of the dispositions of the first. The statement that, quote, in typically functioning human beings, mind reading yields a non-propositional, direct and immediate intuitive knowledge of persons and their mental states, end quote, does raise questions of scope. That is to say, what is the extent to which mental states are directly observable? If this is to say only that some such knowledge is part of the ordinary human repertoire, the claim is unexceptionable. But were one to think that mental states were in general directly perceptible, this would seem to understate the role of intentional disclosure in personal relations. However, the perception that personal life is on a continuum from that which is directly perceivable to that which is private in the sense that it can only be revealed by the person, but not simply intuited, seems consistent with the account she gives of shared attention. The exploration of personal knowledge and of co-naturality achieved via friendship in terms of contemporary neural science is fascinating, but it is with respect to the analogical extension of this consideration to God that the analysis encounters difficulty, especially with respect to the following observation, quote, and so although God can know that Jerome intends to hit Paula, it seems that he cannot mind read Jerome's intention in the direct and intuitive way Paula can, end quote. She continues arguing that, quote, a human psyche is too small and God's mind is too great, one might say, for God to contain human mental states within himself in the shared way the relevant neural system enables us between human beings, end quote. So, quote, the sharing and the presence with a person that is the hallmark of the knowledge of persons is ruled out for God, end quote. Yet she notes that these appearances are misleading because owing to the incarnation, quote, through the assumed human nature of Christ, God can have empathy with human persons and can also mind read them. Since God can use the human mind of the assumed human nature to know human persons such that for every human person, God can also be present with her in this way. Thus, quote, the Chalcedonian formula for the incarnate Christ gives a way of explaining and defending God's knowledge of persons through mind reading and the presence with a human person that God's mind reading enables God to have, end quote. About this and the consequent extension to the question of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it seems to me that there are two significant difficulties, the second multi-dimensional. As to the first, there is no need or reason to deny the human empathy of Christ and thus no need to deny that this belongs in a sui generis way to the second person of the Trinity through the assumed human nature. The difficulty is more what seems to be lacking in the formulation. The first thing that arguably might be missed is that the properly divine knowledge of God is indeed infinitely more perfect and comprehensive than any human knowledge, including empathetic knowledge. Professor Stone's formulation does affirm that the knowledge of God is too great to contain human mental states within itself. But the implication of too great arguably is not fully appropriated, namely that human empathy constitutes an inferior knowledge of the human person by comparison with divine knowledge, and precisely in terms of intuitivity. The focus on empathy could be taken, I think this would be a misconstrual, but the potentia is there, could be taken as offering a purely anthropocentric ratio for the incarnation. That is, as implying that God needs the incarnation to love creatures empathetically, whereas humanity more principally needs the incarnation to love and worship God in a divinely mediated way. And everything that is perfective in empathy seems to be more perfectly present in properly divine non-empathetic knowledge. This is simply to say what Augustine and Thomas Aquinas teach, that God is closer to the creature than it is to itself. God is the source of every created good, but also is the one who sustains and actuates the creature uh, 
in all its motions toward the good is aware of human misery with an intuitive completeness that the human mind as such does not begin to approach. It is true that this is not empathy in the sense of a neural configuration permitting a sharing in human dispositions. And it is true that it is a virtue for human persons to suffer with our friends and to bear their sorrows, yet the condition for God being present to every person as infinitely wise and loving healer and redeemer is the infinite divine perfection and consequent perfect liberty of God from all evil, the very impassibility to which she was very uh, rightly referring. God's knowledge possesses super eminently and formally whatever there is of perfection in empathetic knowledge without possessing its created limitations. When the woman uh, of Matthew 9.20 strained to touch the cloak of Jesus, she did not do so in the hope that he could feel precisely in the way that she felt, but in the hope of being healed and restored, yearning for fullness of life. Likewise, the woman at the well did not inquire about our Lord's empathy and was drawn to the water that slakes all thirst. John 4, 14, quote, whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life, end quote. We would think it odd were the woman to have responded, yes, that's very well, but does God feel about this as do I? Christ's empathy follows upon his humanity, but one might think that the divine knowledge in Christ is and should be infinitely more consoling to the human person than any such human empathy. Thus, there is no denial of the perfection of the divine knowledge in Professor Stump's paper, quite the contrary, yet there also does not seem to be as clearly delineated the affirmation, as it were, that God possesses the full intuitive perfection of which human empathy is merely a spark, perfect love and wisdom extending to every human condition and ill, healing, redeeming, and elevating. God qua God does not possess the same disposition of empathy with human persons because this disposition requires matter, which limits its perfection. But just as one would not say that the Eucharist is not a sufficient menu inasmuch as it does not minister univocally to the same human needs as celebrated in Babette's feast, so it seems odd to speak of the incarnation principally in terms of the acquired human powers of empathy subsequent upon the assumption of human nature by the word. Thus, when Professor Stump writes, quote, so the Chalcedonian formula for the incarnate Christ gives a way of explaining and defending God's knowledge of persons through mind reading and the presence with a human person that God's mind reading enables God to have, we might concur, while nonetheless considering that because God is more present to each person than that person is to herself, this is a more perfect presence than any constricted mode, materially constricted mode of empathy could be. Yet this does not obviate the truth of the proposition that God in Christ does possess human empathy. On in the score, it seems to me the analysis that is given is, is, is uh, quite reasonable. However, it's not merely with respect to the perfection of divine knowledge as such, but with respect to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that further questions arise. Here the difficulty seems to consist in a methodological limitation of consideration that perhaps calls for complementary judgments to give out, to round out the picture. The second problem I would present in terms of three related considerations. First, the emphasis upon conscious awareness as opposed to being and upon the moral effects of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, conscious acts and love, occurs with minimal reference to the more primary essential effects of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. This could be misconstrued. Again, I do think it would be a misconstrual, but there's a certain potentia in this for misconstruing the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and unit of love to uh, simply a psychic state of consciousness. Also by his atonement, Christ fulfilled all the precepts of the old law, not merely the moral precepts, but the ceremonial and judicial precepts. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is mediated. Thus, secondly, this problem also pertains to the relative absence of essential soteriological judgments that are more primary than those regarding conscious awareness and are presupposed to this aspect of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. This, again, it, it may be merely a methodological limit dictated by the object engaged, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is essentially mediated by Christ's atonement. 
Thus one notes the importance of Christ's satisfaction vis-a-vis -vis the passion of, of sin as an impediment to union with God and of the need for this impediment to be removed if one is to achieve union of charity with the infinitely perfect God. Sin introduces not merely disorder, but a debitum of just punishment, and this must be removed without the essential relation of suffering in Christ to Christ's love and obedience, as Thomas brings out in the uh, third part of the Summa Theologiae, question 48, article two, the atonement, the passion as redemptive in as much as Christ offers to God, something infinitely more valuable than sacrifice taken separately, namely sacrifice proceeding from obedience does not occur. For similar reasons, Christ's perpetual, perpetual presence in the Eucharist distressed by Aquinas under the aspect of friendship, because friends need to be together. A togetherness with the God who is infinitely perfect beatitude that cannot occur for so long as the person is disordered in sin. The Holy Spirit purifies, elevates, and supernaturalizes the person, rendering the person to be a fit subject for actions that are supernaturally meritorious. These characteristics of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit seem foundational. This brings me to the third aspect under which the self-same difficulty arises, namely in regard to the Holy Spirit's indwelling itself. Professor Stump rightly notes that, quote, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is meant to be something ontologically more powerful than mutual closeness accompanied by intense shared attention, end quote. Yet despite the proposition that, quote, the immaterial God cannot be contained within a material container, the emphasis is placed upon, quote, God's being somehow within the psyches of those who are in grace, end quote. Of course, the somehow is crucial. I've long thought that secundum quid is the most sublimely useful of all Latin phrases. Uh, and, and so in a certain respect, this is true. Yet metaphysically viewed, the Holy Spirit is present owing to the ab extra missions of the persons of the Trinity and by the Holy Spirit's distinctive operation ad extra in the human soul, whereby the person again is, plur, plur, I almost said plurified, which would be very bad for the person, uh, uh, whereby the person is purified, elevated, and the person's life and actions are supernaturalized, hence the gifts. Only as following upon the soteriologically mediated operation of the Holy Spirit do the unitive fruits of peace and love come to be. All this is in virtue of the divine mediation and satisfaction of Christ, and so again draws our attention to the manner in which God removes the impediment of sin to our final good. In conclusion, it's a characteristic of fruitful analyses such as those of Professor Stump that they raise further considerations the transcendence and primacy of the divine causality, the infinite perfection of divine knowledge, the essential mediation of the entire order of grace by the atoning passion of Christ as removing the impediment of sin that would otherwise block union with God and the distinctive operation of the Holy Spirit in elevating the person and supernaturalizing the person's action are perhaps such considerations. Thank you. <laughs>